Greg, what a pleasure to have you this evening at Malaprop's virtual author event. Welcome. Thank you. And it's really great to be here. I'm very happy to be here. So shall I begin? Please go right ahead. Okay. Well, let me share my screen and get my presentation going. If I can get it, ah, there we go. Hopefully everybody can see that at this point. And so what I'd like to talk about tonight, I was gonna tell you a little bit about the book and I'm really gonna tell you also a bit of a short abridged version of what the book is about, which is about the history of invisibility, why we are interested in it and what it's all about. And really the starting point is to jump near the end of the story, which is in 2006. There were a couple of scientific papers that appeared back to back in the journal Nature, which is a very high profile scientific journal. And both papers describe theoretically how it may be possible to design a structure that guides light around a central region and sends it on its way as if there's nothing at all. So we're really talking about invisibility cloaks. And the lines, these are the simulations from the two papers, basically indicate the direction or the path of light rays as they travel around the hidden central region. And this was a description, the first description in a scientific journal of somebody proposing that an invisibility cloak might actually be possible. And since then, Invisibility cloaks have been everywhere. There's been news articles almost every year appearing in the newspapers or science magazines suggesting that invisibility is almost here, that we've got invisible things that are just about to show up. And any day now, there might be somebody standing right over your shoulder who's invisible that you can't see. And shout out to my favorite headline, which if anybody wants to ask a question about this at the end, invisibility cloak makes tanks look like cows is one of my favorites. And you may wonder how I got involved in all of this. Well, I did my PhD at the University of Rochester with Professor Emil Wolf, who I talk about in the book quite a bit. And Professor Wolf actually set me up with doing research on sort of early concepts of invisibility in optical science. And I graduated in 2001. And in 2003, he asked me to write a review article on the subject, which is what's shown there. And at the time, I thought maybe my career was doomed because I was doing a PhD study on a subject that was really weird and that really nobody seemed to care about. But I didn't appreciate the brilliance of Professor Wolf because by doing my thesis on something that nobody at the time really cared about, I became by default the world's expert on invisibility for a few years. And so I was sort of already connected to the invisibility work when the ma these major papers came out in 2006. So what I really wanted to talk about today, and I'll do a little bit of reading from the book, but I'll also show you a lot of cool images is I want to talk about how does invisibility work? And the whole point of the book is really that understanding invisibility also involves understanding at least a little bit how light works and how light behaves. And some of the concepts that we want to talk about today and are covered in more detail in the book are how is science and science fiction attempted to create invisibility? What sort of non-evil uses are there for invisibility? Because if you read a lot of science fiction, most of the time when invisibility appears, it's being used as a tool by sinister people for nefarious ends. And then finally, will we ever actually see an invisibility cloak? Is it actually going to be possible to make one or not? And I'll give my opinions on that as well. But where I like to start is the oldest scientific attempt at a story about an invisibility, because long before scientists really considered invisibility, science fiction writers were thinking about, is it scientifically possible for something to be invisible? And the earliest story that I know of, of this type, was written in 1859 by the Irish-born American writer Fitzjames O'Brien. And I talk a lot about O'Brien in the book because he's a fascinating character. And um, he really was sort of 
He was very, very fast living guy who likes to spend money and live in luxury, but couldn't really afford it. He moved to the United States and was selling stories to pay the bills. And he apparently he made friends and enemies in equal measure. And there's one anecdote that I got from one of the few references on him that I'd like to share. So a literary career was inadequate to sustain the luxurious lifestyle that O'Brien had become accustomed to. And reports suggest that he was in debt much of the time, lived wherever he could find someone to give him room, and generally had more hard times than good. He was also a man of great charisma, but poor temper, making lifelong friends with some people he encountered and enraging others. An excellent anecdote of his dual nature was provided by his friend, Thomas Davis, years after O'Brien's death. And this is the anecdote. Donald McLeod, author of Pinshurst, was once O'Brien's comrade and they slept in the same bed. One night, just after they had retired, a fierce discussion arose between them with reference to Scotch and Irish nationality, and O'Brien uttered opinions which his Scotch companion could not brook. I'll not allow this, cried McLeod. Do as you please about that, said O'Brien. I'll demand satisfaction, sir, roared McLeod. Very well, answered Fitzjames, equally enraged and belligerent and pulling the blanket well over himself. Very well, sir, you know where to find me in the morning. This last explosion, though intended in deadly sincerity, had the effect of turning the quarrel to laughter and so made an end of it. So O'Brien was a real character, so it was not surprising to see him come up with one of the first invisibility stories. And what was it was this very first invisibility story that attempted to give a scientific explanation. Of course, stories of invisibility had, have existed for thousands of years, but O'Brien was the first one to try and say, yes, this could actually happen. And I like to give a short synopsis of his story titled, What Was It? So the story, What Was It? involves two gentlemen who decide to spend the night in a house that is reputedly haunted when they're attacked by an invisible monster. Well, they quickly overpower the monster between them and tie it up, and then it dies. The end. So not really the most compelling um, narrative, but it's really an interesting story and noteworthy because of the fact that O'Brien tries to explain this, sci this invisibility scientifically. And one of the characters says, it's not theoretically impossible to make a glass which shall not reflect a single ray of light, a glass so pure and homogeneous that the rays from the sun shall pass through it as they do the air, refracted but not reflected. So the question is, is there anything to O'Brien's story or his explanation? And he uses the word refraction, and refraction is one of the oldest recognized optical phenomena. When light goes from one medium to another, it changes direction. This is refraction, and it involves the speed of the light changing as it goes from one material to another. This is a very practical problem for spear fishermen who, when they're trying to spear a fish under the water, have to aim at a location different from where the fish actually appears to be, because the fish is actually closer thanks to refraction. And if you put a straw in a bowl of water, the straw image will appear to be bent due to the effects of refraction. Well, to give to dive just a little deeper on refraction, and I promise this is the only scientific equation I'll show tonight, Snell's law is the law that describes how the direction of light changes when it goes from one medium to another. So you imagine if light comes in with an angle theta one with respect to the normal, it'll be refracted at an angle theta two, it'll change direction. And that change of direction is dictated by the refractive index of the two media. And the refractive index is basically a number characteristic of a, of a particular material that says how much the speed of light is slowed in that medium. So in vacuum and in air, the refractive index is basically one. In water, it's 1.33. The highest refractive index known in nature is diamond, which is 2.419, and that's what gives diamond its sparkliness. 
But O'Brien was off the mark here in attempting to explain invisibility because transparency, having something that's transparent is not the same as invisibility. The phenomenon of refraction changes the direction of a light wave. And that in itself will make a transparent object detectable. If light goes through a flat pane of glass, like a window, well, then it ends up coming out the same direction as it went in and it shifts in direction. And that's why windows are very, very hard to see and very good for, you know, barriers to the outside. But if you have any sort of piece of glass that has an irregular shape, the light rays that come out are going to be going in very different directions than they come in. And this is exactly how we make lenses for glasses or cameras or telescopes or microscopes. So trans if there's a if there's a difference of refractive index between the material and the and air, you're going to see those light rays get distorted and the object will be detectable. And Furthermore, um, it turns out that there's almost always going to be some reflected light when light goes from one medium to another. Whenever you have refraction, you're going to have reflection. So O'Brien's idea that you can make a glass that's perfectly non-reflecting doesn't really work. There's almost always some light reflected from a, an interface. This is why people don't walk into glass doors at, at least most of the time, of course. If the lighting is just right, it can be very hard to see glass. But in general, transparency is not the same thing as invisibility. Now, this is actually kind of, this was also recognized by a later very famous author who also wrote on invisibility, Jack London, who wrote The Call of the Wild and To Build a Fire. He wrote a story in 1906 called The Shadow and the Flash. And this story involves two rival scientists who come up with different ways of making themselves invisible. Lloyd Inwood makes himself perfectly black so that no light is reflected from him at all, but he still casts a shadow, so you can still detect him because he casts a shadow. And Paul Tichlorn makes himself perfectly transparent, but this idea of refraction means that he's still detectable. And these are a couple of original images from the um, story that appeared in 1906. The image on the right shows the man getting painted perfectly black and his leg has already disappeared. And on the bottom, you have the image of the two men fighting that on a tennis court to the death. And the um, person who's made himself perfectly transparent, nevertheless, by refraction, he creates sun dogs, wind dogs, rainbows, halos, and perihelia. He escaped Lloyd's shadow only to fetch up against the rainbow flash. So this again says, okay, transparency is not the same as invisibility, but it also introduces another concept that's quite fascinating. And that is, can we make invisibility by this idea of perfect absorption? And there are super absorptive paints like Vanta Black that was developed in 2014. And these paints are so absorptive that light pretty much is not reflected from them at all. And you might think, how could that make something invisible? Well, artist Anish Kapoor, who eventually paid for the rights to create a, to use Vanta Black exclusively for his artwork, all the way back in 1992, he created an exhibit called Descent into Limbo, which was a hole in the ground floor coated with this perfectly black paint on the inside. And so somebody walked into that hole because they couldn't tell it was a hole. And he was briefly hospitalized. Now, this is actually relevant to our later discussion of in how actual invisibility works. And I'll explain why in a few minutes. But paints like Vanta Black, how do they work? Well, they basically are a bunch of little carbon tubes the carbon nanotubes, as they're called, and they're tangled together like a forest. And the way that this, these paints become super absorptive is light particles coming into this forest get lost inside. And they spend a lot of time bouncing around inside this tangle of tubes until they finally get absorbed. And I kind of say sort of a rough analogy to the Hansel and Gretel story of the photons are like the kids getting lost in the forest until they come across the witch's house. 
And to give you an idea of how effective Vantablack is, it's about 99.965% absorbing, where most paints that are black that are on the market are about 80% absorbing. And if you don't believe that Vanta Black is that absorbing, in 2022, a watch company introduced a watch painted with Vanta Black, and they put that watch against a Vanta Black background. And as you can see, when the watch is against that background, you cannot at all see that the watch is there except for the non painted watch hands. It's a really fascinating and eerie effect. And that'll be important going forward and talking about how invisibility actually works. But let's talk about one other historic story. And that's The Invisible Man from 1897 by H.G. Wells. And this is one of the original ads from that era. And Wells knew a little bit more about optics than Fitz James O'Brien did, because he was trained as a science teacher. And of course, he wrote a lot of science fiction eventually. And his story describes a scientist who rashly imbue, imbues his body with permanent invisibility and finds that it is not all that it is cracked up to be. And so the story is quite fascinating because it shows you that contrary to what a lot of previous fantasy stories had suggested, being invisible comes with a practical downside. And Wells suggested that the his way to explain invisibility was to go beyond transparency and talk about so-called index matching. And index matching is the idea that if you can make a material that has the same refractive index as the medium around it, that object will effectively be invisible because there will be no, in, there will be no refraction at all. And you can do some practical demos of this. On the left, something you can buy very cheaply at a craft store are water beads. And these beads are themselves about 99% water, but they're solid objects. You put them in a glass of water and you can't see that there's anything there unless you actually fish them out of the water itself. And on the right, I have Pyrex glass. Pyrex glass has almost the same refractive index as mineral oil. So when you put the pyrex and the min in the um, pyrex and the mineral oil, it seems to almost melt at the surface and very nearly disappear. So you can do this demonstration in certain liquids, but air has very much the same refractive index as empty space. So it's not really possible to do index matching in air. You're basically trying to make a material that has the same optical properties as nothing at all. Well, this brings us forward to um, the mid 1990s. There's actually a lot of intermediate history of scientists discovering certain types of invisibility from the early 1900s all the way up into the early 1990s. There were other ways in which invisibility started to make its way into serious scientific discussion. But the game changer was the discovery of John Pendry of metamaterials. And here again, I'll read a little bit of from the book about metamaterials. And so this brings us at last to the genesis of modern invisibility physics and an entirely new branch of optical science. In the mid 1990s, researchers at the UK based company GEC Marconi were working on techniques for reducing the radar cross-section of structures, and they had developed a carbon-based material that was very effective at absorbing radar. However, they had no idea why their material was so effective. They asked John Pendry, a professor of theoretical physics at Imperial College London, to see if he could solve the mystery. On a very small scale, the material consisted entirely of extremely thin carbon fires that, fibers that overlapped with each other. The structure is reminiscent of the forest of carbon fibers that gives Vanta black paint its extreme blackness. Pendry realized that the unusual radar absorbing properties of Marconi's material came from this structure. This observation was a significant revelation. Throughout most of the history of optics, researchers have manipulated the behavior of light and materials through chemistry. 
By choosing a material with the right chemical properties, one can achieve a desired optical result. But the Marconi material showed that it is also possible to change the optical properties of a material by changing the structure of the material on a sub-wavelength scale. By making these manipulations of the material structure, it is then in principle possible to design materials with optical properties not found in nature at all. And these materials, Pendry eventually coined the term metamaterials for them, meta referring to something beyond. So these were materials beyond what could be found in nature. And as I said, it's very fascinating that Pendry's revelation ties very much back to this sort of tangled mess of fibers from which Vantablack came as well, somewhat later. Well, Pendry's first discussion of metamaterials didn't necessarily get a lot of attention, but in the year 2000, he caused this huge scientific stir by predicting that you could make a metamaterial that would have a negative index of refraction. And because it has a negative index of refraction, the light ray would be refracted kind of in the opposite sense of ordinary refraction. And now if you remember, I said the refractive index, we tend to think of the refractive index as representing the amount by which the speed of light is reduced in matter. So Pendry was really saying that you could actually make the speed of light in a material negative in a sense. And furthermore, he said, well, if you have a flat slab of this negative refractive index material, any light ray that goes in the material will be refracted twice, once when it comes into the material, once when it comes out of the material, and it'll form a perfect image of whatever's in the source plane. And that image would in principle be perfect and would surpass any resolution limitations of ordinary optical lenses. And as I was a graduate student at the time when this paper came out, I can tell you that the optics community kind of collectively lost their minds about it. And they, people were in a flurry and a, a rush to try and prove that Pendry was wrong, but Pendry has been proven mostly correct. Now you might ask, what does a metamaterial look like? What am I talking about when I say a material with a certain structure? Well, the way Pendry envisioned it and others eventually built some of these materials is you imagine these sort of meta atoms. You imagine instead of, instead of imagining the fundamental structure of your material being the atoms in nature, you make slightly larger structures that form the building blocks of your material. And those are called meta atoms. And an early meta material used to present, prove negative refraction could happen consisted of these little, what are called split ring structures. And this was done for microwaves. So the materials uh, and the structure could be seen with the naked eye. A number of years later, people showed that these metamaterials could be made for light waves that are almost visible light. And then in this case, people made this sort of stacked fishnet structure as they called it. And they took a scanning electron microscope image to show that this could happen. Well, that's one piece of the puzzle to how do you make an actual invisibility cloak? Because being able to manipulate the structure of a material isn't quite enough. You need to know how, what form do you want that material to take in order to create invisibility? And this also ended up being something that John Pendry concocted and discovered. He came up with a technique, a theoretical technique called transformation optics. And transformation optics borrows heavily from Einstein's general theory of relativity. In Einstein's general theory of relativity, gravity is represented by a warping of space and time, a physical warping of the actual space and time. Well, Pendry said, hey, if we actually imagine we've got space and we imagine a theoretical warping of space, like we poke a hole in space, we pull that hole wide to create a cavity, a gap in space, that'll locally distort space around it. And in fact, any light rays that go around will be perfectly deflected, but will otherwise not be affected. And Pendry showed 
that you could then find what sort of properties that material would have to have to have exactly that behave exactly the same as that warping of space. So you're never physically warping space, but you can find a material that perfectly mimics that warping. And this is exactly what happened in 2006 when researchers released these papers on theoretical invisibility cloaks is they used this idea of transformation optics to create a warping of a mathematical warping of space and to design the materials, a material structure that would bend light rays around a central region and send it on its way. Now, I like to tell this story that um, when these invisibility cloak papers came out, I was um, acquainted with one of the authors of these papers, Alf Lanhart. I talked to him back in 2003 about invisibility as I knew it. And so when these invisibility cloak papers came out in 2006, uh, Ulf Lanhart kind of said, hey, go talk to this guy, Greg Gabor. He knows what we're doing. He'll explain it to you and give you some perspective. And inevitably what happens is um, journalists will ask you, when do you expect that we'll actually see an invisibility cloak? And my answer at the time, I thought to myself said, well, I'll say five years because I don't think it's going to happen right away. And in five years, nobody will remember what I said anyway. Well, turns out that some of the people that wrote some of the theory papers came up with the first demonstration experimentally six months later. So I looked a little, I looked a little foolish in the end. And they designed an invisibility cloak that only worked for microwaves. And it was a flat structure. So it was only guiding waves around in a kind of sandwich between two metal plates. They were sending these microwaves down past this cloak, but it showed that the principles were sound and that mathematically and physically it was possible. And the key experimental picture, it's the lower right one. These ripples are the waves. And as these waves interact with this invisibility cloak, they get guided around it. And it's not perfect, but they're kind of sent along as if they saw nothing at all. You might want to try making your own invisibility cloak. And most of us don't have the ability to make a perfect invisibility cloak. But if you ever want to demonstrate this light guiding idea, you can do it with a set of eight right angle prisms. And if you arrange the prisms just right, then when you look from one side of this prism configuration, you will see exactly what's behind it because the light rays will be reflected internally at all these boundaries and will come out the other side parallel to where they came in. And this is my own crude demonstration of this on the right. Um, when I put my finger behind it, um, you can see my finger. When I put my finger inside it, you can't see it. And then when I scan and tilt the whole foot, the whole structure upwards, you see that for some reason I threw a dinosaur inside that you can't see at all. So it works as a very nice demonstration that, yeah, even if we can't in our own homes make this sort of invisibility cloak, we can make light guiding structures that show off the principle of it. But we're not really there yet in terms of can we make something invisible? For one thing, in order to make a metamaterial for visible light, you need to be able to manipulate the structure of matter on the scale of a billionth of a meter. You basically need to, need to assemble your invisibility cloak using little Lego blocks that are a billionth of a meter on a side, and then put those blocks together to make a structure that's big enough to hide something you care about. And you might imagine that we don't really know how to do that yet. Also, there's a problem that I often call the detour problem. That is, if light is going through the middle of your invisibility cloak, it has to take a detour around the hidden region. But if it, um, it has to come out and it has to arrive at the right side of the picture in the same amount of time that a light ray going outside the cloak would take because otherwise you could detect that time delay of the detour. But that means that the light making a detour in the vi invisibility cloak has to make a, has to go faster than the vacuum speed of light inside the cloak 
in order to make the invisibility perfect. And we don't really know how to do that exactly either. But researchers have come up with really cool ways to get around this. Uh, John Pendry, again, and one of his colleagues in 2008 said, hey, if we try to make an invisible object that instead of hiding from all possible directions, just hides an object on a flat surface, that's a lot easier to make. And you can actually make a crude experimental demonstration using a material called optical calcite. And a professor named Bail Zhang demonstrated a small version of this somewhere back around 2009, where he puts this little carpet cloak, as they call it, on top of a little tube, and you can't see the tube at all because the light gets guided over the top of that region. And because it's hiding something on a flat surface, Pendry and his colleagues called it hiding under the carpet. There's, that's actually the physics, the title of the physics paper that was written. Now, one of my favorite little demonstrations of this, Professor Zhang also a few years later made an even larger modified cloak that was big enough to hide a little kitten in it. So it's the kitty cloak as I like to call it. And again, it's not a perfectly invisible object, but it does convincingly show you that light can be guided around a central region. And incidentally, I fought really hard to get this picture in my book because I love cats. And so I demanded that I have a cat photo of, for some reason, in my book when it got published, which I was successful at. Now to wrap up here, um, let me just say a few words about what can we do with invisibility? Is it just for evil? Well, in fact, it's not. Um, one of the things that's very important about invisibility is it's helped us to understand medical imaging techniques. Everybody's probably familiar with medical imaging techniques like a classic CAT scan or an MRI. And these medical imaging techniques basically collect a lot of data and then they throw that data into a computer and that computer then churns out an image. But it's not really obvious mathematically at first whether, there's a, whether your image that you produce is missing anything. Is there anything that your detection scheme is not seeing? And it turns out that invisibility played a role in this because you can show that your medical imaging system is a good system if it does not allow invisible objects like a ghost or an invisible man in your scanning system. So invisibility has a connection to medical imaging. Now, one other really great demonstration is in 2003, even before the invisibility cloak stuff came out, Professor Susumu Tachi made an invisible coat, which this is a gif that of the coat in action. Also not truly invisible because basically the way it works is there's a camera behind the coat that records the scene and then it projects it onto the coat itself, which is made of a highly retroreflective material. So if you're standing in the right place, the person looks ghostly. And I love in this gift that there's just some random student walking by, not really concerned at all about the fact that there's some weirdo kind of walking around with a ghost cloak on. Now, Professor Tachi suggested, among other things, that this technology might be used to make airplane cockpits or the insides of cars effectively invisible so that you could have full view of everything around you. If you're worried about bumping into an object near your car or if you're flying an airplane and you want to be able to make sure there's nothing underneath you, that this could be an aid to cars and airplanes. So another example of invisibility having a use that goes beyond just being evil. And finally, one of the most promising things I've seen is people have recognized that if you can make a cloak that guides light waves around a central region, you can do the same thing for other waves. So people have proposed making seismic cloaks that you put structures in the ground around a building and you can guide at least part of an earthquake's waves around that building, making it more resistant to destruction. And this was actually tested in 2013. They drilled a bunch of holes in the ground. They used a pile driver to make very shallow seismic waves. And then they measured 
the intensity of those waves. And they found that their source, which is surrounded by red here, that those holes, which are the little white dots here, effectively block those seismic waves from getting past. So the future of invisibility may be more in protection than in hiding things. So is invisibility possible? There's a lot of practical and theoretical challenges that remain, but more can be done than we thought even 20 years ago. And I personally, I think one day we'll see remarkable demonstrations of invisibility that will just blow our minds. But I have a feeling we won't see invisibility as sort of a day-to-day -day thing. We'll probably see most of the practical output of invisibility in examples like the earthquake cloaking that I mentioned. But I try not to speculate too much because the future of invisibility is very hard to see. And I mentioned cats. Not only do I have my book on invisibility, but I also have a book on the history of scientists studying how cats land on their feet. And I will stop there. And hopefully I didn't take up too much of your time. Thank you very much for listening. Well, that was wonderful to hear. And I just enjoyed, I think I need to go back and I'm just going to watch all those videos again. I'm going to, let me just tell everybody in the audience that, of course, because you registered for this event, you used a link to access it and you can go back to it like I'm going to and listen to this whole presentation again, because I really am amazed at what you've compiled here, Greg. What what an incredible you know, overarching history, but also wonderful set of explanations for how invisibility works that that was a really astounding thank you so much for bringing it to the lay people out there we we need you <laughs> well you're very welcome and that's part of the reason i've been blogging for about 17 years now is that i wanted to reach this point where i could explain things without using a lot of math well and, and we thank you <laughs> <laughs> thank you for bringing down those barriers a little bit for us because we we need that and i love it that uh you mentioned how these things work like the invisibility cloak uh and it petrifies me to think about like being for example in an airplane like oh well that's what the ground <laughs> i mean it's just kind of was where where will this go but but it would be good to have that with your car right you think you might not bump into that curb just saying that for a friend not that i know anybody who hits the curb a lot when they drive I'm just speaking for friends there you know who might be listening so a uh, question uh, for you greg now you've immersed yourself in this study but you also mentioned your blog that's connected to horror fiction so where do these worlds meet and overlap well um yeah, I originally started my blog because I love I love horror fiction and I love science and I thought, well, I'll just throw I'll just write about whatever I feel like. And at first it was there was sort of no thought given to the connection. But really, um, if you look at the history of horror and you look at the history of science, you find that horror fiction often draws inspiration from the science of the time. Um, and you see a lot of that in invisibility, because as I trace sort of the history of invisibility, starting with science fiction writers, you can see how the science fiction writers were all drawing from whatever had gotten people's attention at the time scientifically. So H.G. Wells wrote, he explained his invisibility in part by referring to x-rays, which were discovered only two years before he wrote his book. And everybody, when x-rays were discovered, it was a popular misconception. People thought x-rays actually made you invisible. And Wells sort of capitalized on that. And later horror authors, you find, often draw from science and the way it unsettles people. So I'll give you one more example, because I can go on for hours about this. Good, please. Um, you know, in the early 20th century, um, we started to discover that the universe was much bigger than we thought and much stranger. So we discovered that 
there wasn't just one galaxy. There were actually thousands of galaxies, all with millions of stars. And Albert Einstein came up with this general theory of relativity that showed that space and time are warping and intermingled. And uh, horror author H.P. Lovecraft was one of many who drew directly from that. In a lot of his writing about non-Euclidean geometry and stuff, he actually attended popular science lectures about these topics, and he drew a lot of inspiration that way. And there's a lot of authors that did. Well, you can see that if you're a person who enjoys also films, you can see that reflected in a lot of movies that include invisibility or some way optical illusions. And is it there? Is it not there? Um, I really enjoy that as well. How um, this is a kind of a process question. So how do you write? What do you, and are you distracted by a lot of uh, reading of horror, watching horror films, or can, are you very focused? Oh, um, a little bit of both. Um, I actually can get distracted largely because I start reading about a topic and it really sends me down the metaphorical rabbit hole. So I start, I start reading like, one scientific paper, one story to get get some background for what I want to write about. And suddenly I'm like, ooh, this reference is something else. And it sends me down this path that um, I disappear for ages. Um, in fact, one, one good example of this is the end of my invisibility book includes what I jokingly called the invisibibliography, which is a list of a large number of science fiction and horror and visibility stories. And that really came about in the last few months before I submitted the book to the publisher because I'd already read a couple dozen invisibility stories, but I was like, you know, I really haven't looked at a lot of pulp magazines. There's probably a few more stories out there that I haven't found. And then I just found dozens of other stories um so many stories that you don't really find anybody mention on online i had done a bunch of searches for stories online about invisibility and most of these were not talked about and so i said oh i got it so that sent me like weeks of late night reading of invisibility stories and i insisted on throwing that bibliography in the book because i was like it's got to go somewhere Right. I mean, you're doing this research and you're also uh, finding these areas of connection of how science and particularly invisibility uh, makes it into popular culture, makes it into even the zeitgeist, right? So I think it's apropos that, that you have that uh, invisibibliography. I think that's that, uh, a great uh, title for it. And so, yay, I'm glad you uh, advocated for that. And of course, for uh, what you mentioned that you had to have the cat uh, in there as well. Let's just, uh, let's just say, you know, some things are worth fighting for. And that certainly yep. was one. Uh, what was your editing process like negotiating things like that do you always have good experiences or what's that like for you as an author um i it was actually quite pleasant i'm pretty i'm pretty laid back about it because i trust that my editors actually want to be it to be a good book so i didn't fight with them on very much um I did end up taking out a few figures. Um, my first Falling Felines book, there are so many photographs of falling cats because there were so many taken and I pretty much left them all in there, which I think irked the publisher just a little bit, but I'm like, no, these are all relevant. These are all important figures. Yes. <laughs> no one wants to read a cat book if there are not a lot of cat pictures. Um, exactly. But, yeah. <laughs> So for this one, um, when I when they came back, they're like, you seem to have a lot more you have a lot more images in here than um, we kind of wanted you to have. And I said, OK, I can take I'll take a few of those out. I think I still have more than they wanted in there. 
because I think it's important to try and illustrate a lot of the science. Um, but yeah, overall, I mean, they came back to me with, you know, wording changes or something and said, does that sound reasonable? And um, for the most part, I'm like, yeah, fine. Um, one, one other thing I'll note is my editor actually advocated to save something for me. Um, the subtitle of the book, The History and Science of How Not to Be Seen, is a reference to a Monty Python sketch, How Not to Be Seen, which I also mentioned briefly in the book. And I guess it went to the, um, the advertising people and they said, that sounds very awkward. Could we change it to, you know, how to not be seen? <laughs> And um, fortunately, my editor said, OK, Greg, I'm totally happy to go fight, fight for you for on this. We, we must have standards. And exactly. if there's a reference to Monty Python, we have to defend that, too. I mean, we, we can't just let everything just go. You know, we have to preserve the elements of culture that yeah. are important and very within the, the subtitle. That's what subtitles are for, right? To have the little kind of the wink sometimes if you can get that in there so that's a you know that's a great story where an editor really really took your side on something yep they look they look out for me and like I said I I generally assume that they really want it to be the the best most successful book they can um in fact my original planned title for the book was how not to be seen and then the uh, advertisers and the editor came back and said, well, people may look at that title, and not have any idea what this book is about. <laughs> and said, can we change it to invisibility and move that to the subtitle? And I said, OK, that's fine. We'll do it. As long as the Monty Python reference is preserved, then I think balance is there. That, exactly. That's OK. And it's a reflection of your own approach and taste. And yep. so that that's really important. Yeah, I try to I I try to keep the book a you know somewhat fun and have fun stories like the Fitz James O'Brien anecdote, which um just which still just makes me laugh. I tell that story to anybody who will listen. And I love including stories like that about the people themselves who are doing all this work. Do you find that it's uh that there's a challenge in trying to find those examples or are you uh, overburdened with examples and it's just a, an embarrassment of riches? It is often an embarrassment of riches. Um, there's so many, I mean, it's one of the things that as I became sort of more of a history writer, I gained a really great appreciation for how funny people were back in the day. And if you go back and read a lot of old books and magazines, um, there's a lot of wit and a lot of funny stories and a lot of weird characters. And it's often a challenge to, yeah, say, okay, what's the best, what's the best anecdote about this person that really captures their personality so that the whole book isn't just me quoting people. <laughs> so when you are thinking about uh, next works, things that, that are coming up, do you have something already in mind? Or are you, you know, this is like a book tour anyway, you're on tour and promoting your, your book Invisibility. Uh, is it too early to ask what's next? Um, it might be a little too early because um, I haven't kind of cleared with my publisher yet the idea but I do have a really neat and very sweeping, another strange history of science idea that is also a story about a lot. It's about, about the history of a scientific idea, but also the history of the really strange characters and the strange circumstances that led to its discovery and its consequences. So. I'll leave it there for the moment, but it's a, again a book about history of science up to the modern day and a lot of the weird stuff that happened along the way. Well, that sounds that sounds great, and I wonder if we could tuck in a little reference to falling felines, since since we're both cat lovers and we know that the the kitties are around. I got a visit from one of my little cats, Cash, and just a few minutes ago, 
could you you were going to join us for promoting following felines and of course the pandemic hit so as a as a tip of the hat to that book tell us a little bit about that one as well please sure yeah falling felines and fundamental physics which that was another title i really had to fight to keep but that one i insisted on um is about uh, scientists' surprisingly long history of studying how cats, when they fall, seem to almost always land on their feet. And there's a remarkably long history of physics and science studying how this works, going all the way back to the time of Isaac Newton in the 1700s, and that research really continues up into modern times with people trying to make robotic cats that can do what a cat does. And there's almost this continuous history of people finding new aspects of the falling cat problem and learning something new from it. How Learning how, how to teach astronauts how to turn around in zero gravity, learning how nervous systems work. Like I said, learning how robot, how to make better robots. And so it was a, a book that was inspired by the fact that I originally stumbled across one paper on the science of falling cats. And I said, hey, are there any more papers on this subject? And I just kept finding more and more and more papers. Incidentally, I've got another cat here. Um, oh, and who Mitzi. is that? This is Mitzi, my shyest one if she knew she were on camera she'd be hiding but she doesn't <laughs> well mitzi it's lovely to i think we met mitzi and cookie and daisy right yep. very yep. good oh my gosh well it's a night of celebrities it's like uh <laughs> it's like a cat celebrity pageant in a way yep. and how fitting it's, it's a pleasure to get to talk to you about falling felines and the fundamentals of physics. Did I get that right? I think falling felines and fundamental physics. And fundamental physics, sorry. Falling felines and fundamental physics. Hello, Mitzi. <laughs> Hello. Oh, she's goodbye. <laughs> I tipped it down just so everybody could see her quickly. Very sweet, very sweet. And of course, we're delighted to get a chance to talk with you this evening. It's just uh, wonderful to have you back. And this time it's for Invisibility, the history and science of how not to be seen. Greg Gabor, we really appreciate you joining us. And we look forward to hopefully seeing you in the store at some point uh, when you're in the area. And then when you finish that next book, come on back. I definitely will. Thank you so much for having me. Well, it's a pleasure. Thank you so much, audience. We really appreciate you as well. And thank you, Stephanie, this evening. Everyone, please have a lovely evening. Good night.